three, two, one. You ready? You're listening to the Real Pineapple Podcast Network. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. This is The Real Pineapple. This is your humble host, Hunter, here. And I am so excited to welcome uh, a first-time guest for the show. Um, If you have not listened to it, you definitely should. Check out archives of her former podcast, Ghost or Whatever, a paranormal podcast. I am so sad I was never had a chance to be on there, but God damn it, we're finally recording together. I have my friend. Should I call you Cassie or Cassandra? Like, no, 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 no. You should never, ever, ever call me Cassie. Do not call you guys. Okay, noted. So, so yeah, what what should I, should I does Cassandra work or? Yeah, I go by Cassandra. People ask me this all the time and they're like, is it Cassandra or Cassandra? And I'm like, to me, it's Vase Vaz. As long as you don't call me Cassie, <laughs> we're good. Okay, so can I can I ask the the story behind the no Cassie? Is there a specific reason? There, there really isn't one. It's just I don't know. I'm always a fan of referring to people as their names that they are presented with. So if you were to tell me, "Hey, my name is Josh," that's what I'm going to call you. Um, if you told me, "Hey, my name is Joshua," that's what I'm going to call you. If I get an email or a text message from someone with their full name, that's what I'm going to respond to them as. And I think for me, it goes back to respecting our trans brothers and sisters and non-genders and when they present as a certain like name that's just their name and so for me for years and years if you were to talk to my siblings or my mother or my father you would hear them call me Cassie because that's what I grew up as but over the years I started to kind of tie that in I guess with a very conservative Christian southern upbringing and I worked very very hard to separate that from myself so for me I go by Cassandra my middle name is Jolene Um, my southern family still call me Cassie Joe, and to me it just kind of brings me back to that past that I fought so hard to get out of and honestly Cassie is for me, it's just for me personally, it's just more of a juvenile, like girl, young girl version. And I'm okay. 40 years old. I'm in a wo- I am a woman. And I just love, I love the name Cassandra. I think it's beautiful. I think it harks back to the Greek prophetess. It's one of my favorite Grecian stories in, in mythology. And so I just prefer Cassandra. And I will say as a side note, I have had so many, can I curse? Yeah, oh, oh, we cuss all the time on here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, 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 fuck, because that's all I, that's my forte. So I've had so <laughs> many fucking people, so many fucking people in my life, like, I had a dog named Cassie that I just got really fucking tired of it. <laughs> okay, that's, that, there is, oh God, that's one of those things that I will say for myself. There's nothing that will just make me eye roll quicker than, oh, Joshua, like yeah. in the Bible. And I'm just like, yes, but God damn it. Like, like, can we? Like, like yes, like, but no. Yes, yeah. but no. Like, and that's something, it's actually something we have in common, but not we directly, but that story. My mother, again, being just very religious, I have multiple siblings. I have an older brother named Matthew. I have a younger brother named Noah and another younger brother named Zachariah, who goes by Zach. And then I have Um. a little sister named Sarah. And so all of my siblings got Bible names and they turned out to be pastors and police officers and, you know, real estate agents. And here I am covered in tattoos, piercings, multiple hair color. Like I've lived this crazy life. I'm pansexual. I'm liberal. I'm a witch. Like I'm all of this stuff. And sometimes like my mother, when she questions my life choices, I'm like, mom, you named me after Cassie Joe, the two backup singers for Leonard Skinner. You did this. I, I, I mean, I mean, to be fair, that's that's a much better name association versus, you know, most most people most things in the Bible, too. <laughs> mad she named me after cassandra aka cassie a backup singer for leonard skinner and also there was joe from leonard skinner but also she loved the dolly parton song jolene so i got cassandra jolene as opposed to all the bible names and she wonders why i essentially turned out to be the black sheep i'm like mom you set me up for this you're welcome like you literally couldn't have laid this up any better for me to be to be fair uh god okay i did not know that that actually puts a lot of context in by the way that's part of the reason why i got i go by hunter because a lot of people would go joshi and i'm like don't call me joshi we're not friends don't don't <laughs> like okay, after three years old nobody should be calling anybody joshi or i'll get the i'm just joshing you which is something that i just wanted to 
makes me want to put my head in boiling water, but that's a whole other, that's a whole okay, other. I, I will say in my love of dad jokes, if I have ever actually in the years we've known each other said that to you, I wholeheartedly apologize. <laughs> but see, I'm like friends with you, but I'll have people who I'm not cool with do that. And it's like, we're not on joking terms. Like, don't. <laughs> Like, don't do that shit. So you're you're totally fine if you made that joke. I'm sure everyone that I mostly talk to on a regular basis has made that joke. You're fine. I still love you. Okay, moving on. So moving on. We Ooh. we've known each other for for a minute, and one of the things that we've commonly talked about is our love for what I believe is one of the best shows still on television, which is Bob's Burgers. I so I discovered this because of a. Uh, one of the people who helped me launch this podcast, uh, Colin. Colin, I love you, buddy. Uh, this was one of my, this became like a big stoner show for me. It's like, oh, it's midnight. <laughs> I can't sleep. Uh, what am I going to do? I'll put on a bowl and watch, you know, put on a bowl and watch Bob's Burgers. Now, just my opinion, I will say I think season three is still one of the best uh, seasons of TV ever. I think um, the fact that it starts off with Earsy Rider, that's one of my favorite go-to episodes of Bob's Burgers because it just shows how incredibly intense uh, Louise can be. Because Louise, I think, is the shit. I think Louise is... She'll either solve cancer or she will become become a supervillain. Like, she is... Like, there will be no in-between for Louise. But I love that fucking character. And one of the things that the the writers of the movie had announced was, hey, you're going to find out the reasoning behind, you know, Louise's ears, which was something I was weirdly excited to to, to find out what the, the reasoning was behind that. And to just jump in here, full spoilers, by the way, because, you know, the okay, movie's been... I was going to ask if we could give spoilers because, oh my God, do I have them? I will say... Okay, so the cause going make me sound like such an old man. I love my movies with subtitles, and I really wish that when I went to a theater, I would get subtitles for my shit. But, because I think I miss a lot of the jokes in this, because there were just points where I was just howling, and I'm like, oh, I probably missed, you know, three or four jokes right there. Uh, especially for how the show's written. I needed this theater experience, because it made me so goddamn happy. Plus, I have to see Jurassic Park this week, and I'm really upset about it. Uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah, not thrilled. But this was... Okay, this is a very weird comparison, but stick with me here, people. This would be a great double feature with the Powerpuff Girls movie, because that's another show that you kind of go, okay, I know this movie quote, or sh- this show quote is unquote, but then you watch the movie and it's shockingly darker than what you think the movie will be. And the plot for this movie is way darker than I actually thought the movie would be. And that was actually a welcome surprise. I have to say, so when I got to the end of the movie, I went, I actually have more of an appreciation for the show that I did going in. So, uh... Cassandra, I'm gonna throw it to you. Yeah, kind of talk to me about your 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 experience with the show, how you got into it, and kind of what were you thinking going in. So I will say, let me let me start with my opinion, my overarching opinion on the movie. I agree okay. with you wholeheartedly. I had found out about the movie at work in Big Bear Lake, California. I was running a little gem metaphysical like tarot card like gemstone store and somebody sent me a link on my phone and it was dead. There was no, it's a, it's a tourist town. You're either slammed or there's nobody there. And so it was dead. And I was just kind of meandering around the store and my phone went off and I looked and I'm like, somebody, I don't even know who it was. I should go back and thank this amazing angel for sending me the link. And they're like, Oh my God, did you see they've announced a Bob's Burgers movie for 2022. And this was September, 2021. I Hunter, I was 41 (laughs) years old at the time. I was 41 years old at the time. I started crying. I started crying, laughing. I I was overwhelmed. I couldn't believe it. I went online. I researched it. I was so fucking excited that I found the, the, the movie poster, the teaser poster. I printed it out. I cut off the white borders. I perfectly lined it up and taped it. And I took multiple selfies in the back room of myself until I found the perfect fucking selfie. And I posted it to advertise this fucking movie. And I have been so, so excited about it ever since. So what I intentionally did was anytime Google, when I signed into like Google's homepage, it gives me, you know, like articles and things to click on based on my interests. And it kept on trying to give me articles about Bob's Burgers and it broke my heart every time, but I had to click on not interested. Don't show me this. Not interested. Don't show me this. Because I was so (laughs) determined. I was so determined to not get spoilers I didn't want to know what it was about. I didn't want to know the storyline. 
I didn't want, I'm a huge anti-spoiler person. So I wanted nothing. I wanted to go into this completely blind. And I did this for months. And I will say, I'm so, so glad it was totally worth it. Even seeing Linda in the burger suit with the bikini top, I yeah. took as a spoiler and I was pissed because I knew at some point she'd be wearing that. And I was like, son of a bitch. Like, I just wanted to go in there with a completely open mind, completely new experience. So with that, the first very first opening scene when you see this attack from one person to another, but only played up in shadows being cast upon the prize stuffed animals at Wonder Wharf, I was immediately hooked. I immediately knew this was something different. This was something we were going to be taken on a ride. This was an adventure. I was going to be exploring different parts of these characters. And I was fucking in. I was also half of a 30 ounce blue moon glass in. So I was, <laughs> I was okay. I will also say that my ex-husband and I were massive, massive movie buffs. And we would see movies in the theater when we lived in Reno together for years. Like we would see movies regularly, multiple movies a month. It was our thing. We were always going to movies. But when uh, COVID hit and we ended up splitting and you, he moved back to Virginia and I stayed in Reno and life's kind of parted ways and then COVID hit. It was, um, I just, I, the theaters were closed. And then even when they started to slowly reopen, I didn't feel safe. This was before, you know, our, our vaccinations and our boosters. And even at the thought of sitting, breathing the same air as, you know, complete strangers, even with a mask on, I was still uncomfortable. And so I've only been in a movie theater three times since March of 2020. And two of those times were um, for film, uh, film festivals in Texas and in California. And they were very quick, like you're just there for a few shorts and you're out, everybody's masked, even though we're vaccinated, everything's fine. And then my other experience watching a movie in a theater unmasked was last summer in LA when the movie that I was in um, had its premiere and it premiered for the cast and crew and their guests. So, oh, I'm dropping shit. Hopefully that's not right. Um, so it was, I intentionally saved my first real movie theater experience post COVID for something special. And this was it. And I don't regret any of it. So with that, I know that was kind of a long little- No, no, no. You asked, so there it is. Yeah. Um, I discovered Bob's Burgers at the tail end of season one. I was a massive um, FX channel fan because of Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I was also a massive Archer fan. I've been a fan of H. John Benjamin since his um, home movies days where he played Coach same, McGurk. Same. Yeah, so Coach McGurk was one of my favorite fucking characters. He was so beyond ridiculous. And there you want to hate him, but he was so endearing at the same time that you just couldn't help but love him. And he was so fucking funny and fucked up but at the same time you could tell in some episodes he actually has a heart and when he can he will come around after multiple bad decisions and try to make the right decision so I've, I've loved H. John Benjamin for years and so watching Archer for so long and being such a huge Archer fan I am on the autism spectrum so I'm a little bit with that kind of repetitive like I need that stem I need that repetitiveness I need something playing in the background when I'm cooking when I'm getting ready in the morning showering and makeup when I'm cleaning th there's always something that I'm very familiar with playing in the background because it's comforting it's a very comforting it makes me feel like I'm not alone it's just I, I even though I love discovering new shows I kind of hate it at the same time because I don't know what's going to happen and it kind of raises my my anxiety. So re-watching a show like Bob's Burgers or Archer or Always Sunny in Philadelphia, these shows I've seen so many times, it's a comfort. So with Bob's Burgers, there's never in my 42 years been a television show that has brought me as much comfort as this show has. And so every single day since the end of season one, I have watched the show in some capacity on my phone or on a TV. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I was so excited when fast forward all these years and all these seasons later, I hear that there's going to be a full length feature. Another reason that I was very excited, and this is kind of what I hinted at to you, that I had kind of a backstory to share about my Bob's Burgers adventure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, are you ready? Because this Born. is going to get this is going to get a little heavy. Yes, let's go. OK, uh, we might need to pause and I might need to refill wine. I'm just about finished with my first glass of rosé. Um, OK, so as you know, but your listeners do not. Um, I lived in California for some time. And in that time, because of my current partner, I had the opportunity to work as an art director on an independent film 
called Wing Dad. It was directed by the son of actor and comedian Andy Dick and his lovely wife, and not Andy Dick's wife. This guy's name is Lucas. The director's name is Lucas and Lucas and his wife. Um, this was a passion project of Lucas. This was something he worked very hard to build up to get funding for. Wing Dad is essentially a retake on what it's like to grow up and be an adult now with a parent who, very much like Andy Dick, addicted to drugs, addicted to alcohol, very much in the limelight. Um, you're just a, it's a very tumultuous way to grow up. And, and um, Lucas really wanted to tell a story that kind of was like an homage to his relationship with his dad. And so Wing Dad, uh, we filmed it in the middle of the pandemic in December 2020 in Big Bear Lake, California. It's a very Big Bear movie. We filmed in all Big Bear locations. We had Big Bear cast and crew. We had a few people that would that drove up about an hour and a half from LA and stayed with us. We filmed over multiple weeks. So we knocked this out in the middle of the pandemic following the strictest COVID protocols with a skeleton cast and crew of less than 19 people. And we knocked it out. And I want to say about 19 days, Damn. like, so about three weeks or so, um, not a single one of us got COVID. We were that careful because again, remember this was before vaccinations. Yeah. So for a lot of these people, they risked it because they're in the industry. They, they, they're gig workers. They needed this money and they risked getting COVID to make this money to support themselves. So it was a really big deal. It was high stress, high tension, but it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. It was my first time working on a film. And again, I was hired on as the art director. So when you watch this movie, um, all the props, some of the costumes, like the design in the coffee shop, the writing on the chalkboard, that's all me. That's all your girl. Like I, I did all of that. But I also, because it's indie and it's a small crew, everybody got pulled in to help when needed. And so I did a lot of costume help and I did um, some walk-on extra roles, like background roles, but I also had two scenes that were speaking roles. Now, one of them was for the most part cut. Um, you can see me, I'm wearing a big floppy hat, my pink fluffy jacket, I'm ordering a coffee. I was a super sassy, just super millennial, like Karen-esque type of customer ordering a really, really specific coffee. And it took me the entire night to memorize those lines. And of course, just like in most films, that scene was cut, whatever. But then I had <laughs> another scene where I actually played a different coffee shop customer and I was in my beautiful like organza flowy dress and like my little cardigan and I actually had a speaking line and turns out they voice dubbed me. So it's not even my voice, but whatever. <laughs> neither here nor there. It's still me. It's still me. But the interesting thing and the reason that all of this matters is that our lead actor that played the titular father character, AKA the spinoff of the Andy Dick character is none other than Jay Johnston, the voice of Andy Pesto. A few weeks after we wrapped Wing Dad in Big Bear Lake, California, an hour and a half north of LA, this fucker goes all the way to Washington, DC. Mm -hmm. Of clothing and other items that I think I might get in legal trouble if I say out loud we're there because uh, I don't want to be sued for defamation. So I'm only going on basic facts right now that can be substantiated by the rest of the cast and crew. Um, he, there was some issues during filming. All in all, I thought he was lovely. I was so fangirling. I was so starstruck. I could not believe I was in a film and I had scenes and lines and working hand in hand with this man who was on Bob's Burgers for years. I knew his character. I knew his lines. At one point, I even joked with him about, does anyone at the comic, like the, the when you do live venues and like live shows, does anyone ever call you Baby Num Num? Because, you know, most of the fans of the show recognize that name. And he was like, wait, baby, wait, what? And I was like, dude, it was, it was like one of the first ever episodes, season one. I was like, you, you were like, Jimmy Pesto gets with prostitutes and he likes to wear diapers and his nickname is Baby Num Num. And he starts laughing. He's like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot about that. I forgot about that. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, dude. How do you forget about that? But anyway, he's an actor. He's had multiple roles. That's fair. I let it go. I let it go. Didn't read too far into it. So we're filming this movie together. We're doing all this stuff together. We're working scenes. We're having a blast. The whole time he knew, because I kept telling him, I told him multiple times how overwhelmed I was to be a part of this project with him and how much his work meant to me and how much just 
he as a person, how thankful I was and how honored I was to work with him. And so here we are multiple months later, we're, we're at the premiere in LA and, you know, I had already posted during production. There's a picture of me that he is tagged in that multiple like actors and other people that know Jay Johnston like, because he doesn't have an Instagram page. So I couldn't tag him in it directly, but I hashtagged his name and you know, people saw it and they liked it. They responded to it. And so this was a huge, huge thing for me, just emotionally overwhelmed. I was so happy. Cloud fucking nine. It was a dream come true. With that, we went to the premiere. We had an open bar at this amazing historic building across the street from this amazing little historic theater in downtown LA where our movie showed in a theater with a whole crowd of people and everybody was laughing and cheering and just everybody loved this movie. This movie has gone on to win multiple awards at film festivals. Like this is just, it's a good movie. It has heart and it has the story and the actors were fucking brilliant. And just the, the just, it's such a heart warming, funny film. And everyone was so, so proud of it. And a little while later, Jay Johnston's face and photos of him during the insurrection surrounded by screaming terrorists and American flags and red MAGA hats started appearing online. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, that that can't be him. That can't be him. Because the day of the insurrection, I got the phone calls from my family that my little brother, an officer in DC, was stationed at the Capitol building and was attacked and almost murdered. His finger was sliced open. He had to have stitches. He has a young wife who has been a nurse all during COVID. He has two very small children. Um, he's my little brother. And he was in full riot gear. And a former police officer, a Trump supporter, approached him at the barricade, tried to break through the barricade, grabbed my brother by his mask, and then started to strangle him while he worked him down to the ground. Jesus. Other people joined in and started stomping my brother and spitting on him and calling him names and calling him um, a traitor and all of this other shit. My brother is a very skinny, smallish guy. I'm sorry, Noah, but that's true. That's what you look like. But in right <laughs> here, obviously, he's a bit bulkier. But at that time, these were like the same people that were just, you know, screaming support the police, back the police, back the blue. But then yeah. here they are rioting, storming our capital. Our officers are thinking, now, first of all, let me also, let me also, sorry, Noah, again, but fuck the police, defund the police. That's just my personal opinion. But with that said, he's still my fucking brother. And like, yeah. I don't believe that the whole blue lives thing is a thing. That's a job. When you sign up to be a police officer, it's your fucking job. It's not being like you're born into a class or you're born into a nationality or you're born into a skin color. It's not the same fucking thing. So when people say like, hashtag blue lives matter, I'm like, hashtag go fuck yourself. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> anyway, anyway, with that, I told you I was liberal. With that, he's still my fucking brother. And my brother actually has an incredible track record with community service work. And he's been with the department for maybe five years. And again, his wife was a nurse in the hospitals all during COVID. He's got two small children. So I'm obviously going to take this in a very personal way. All of this attack was caught on my brother's body cam footage. My partner has watched the footage. I cannot bring myself to do it. Um, I have seen stills and that was enough for me. It gave me horrific Fair. nightmares for days. I mean, I'm I was in California. I was on the other side of the fucking country from my family. My family's come together to, you know, support my brother who lived, by the way, he managed to be, somebody dragged him out from underneath the feet of these guys who were punching him, choking him, spitting on him, like stabbing his, his hand through his glove with a broken fiberglass flagpole that like split his finger open. So like he, somebody managed to pull him from the attack and he managed to get up and just started running. He ran to the building. He had never been inside the Capitol building before. He's running through hallway after hallway, just desperately trying to find an exit. But all he could hear around each corner was people screaming, people riding, people making all these noises. And he's thinking, this is it. This is how I'm going to die. This is how I'm going to die. And he finally made it through an accident, uh, an act, excuse me, exit, burst out of the building, found an ambulance, got help. My big brother was on his way from Northern Virginia to DC where my brother was, where Noah was being um, treated. And my, my big brother, Matthew was listening to the radio. And that's when Trump's address was being aired where he called some of these pieces of shit terrorists, like decent people, good people. 
there's good people on both sides blah blah, blah. like great trump he, by the way <laughs> yes thank you thank you i can't i can't get the child raping misogynistic like oh anti-homosexuality voice raspy enough but you get the basic gist of it so yeah. <laughs> he's listening he's listening to this man essentially praise the the terrorists that are doing this horrific just history making embarrassing stain on our fucking country's history he's listening to this man refer to these people like that when he's literally on his way to the hospital to see if his brother a police officer is okay after being attacked and almost murdered by those people so yeah, there's a whole thing there. So with that, with that very long story, and I apologize to your you're, guests you're who good. assumed that this was going to be a lighthearted episode. We'll get Sorry. there, people. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get back there. You have to have the rain to enjoy the sun. Am I right? Exactly. So, we'll uh, say. So thank you. So all of this, all of this, months later, I find out that Jay Johnston was a part of this. And I find photos of him where he just looks jubilant being a part of this and there's thousands of his fans online saying oh my god that that looks like the guy from the sarah silverman show that that looks like the guy that does jimmy pesto that cats calm down that looks like jay johnston and other people were just like no there's no way it just looks like him it's just funny that a guy looks like him some of his fans were in full defense mode they were so so there's no fucking way that this was actually jay johnston they were in yeah. so much denial that they could not accept it there's a video a short video of jay standing with you'll have to forgive me i forget exactly i haven't had the heart to watch it again with one or two other people on kind of a cleared out grassy area outside the capitol building and i think this was before or the heaviest shit went down, but there's two African-American men walking past them. And somebody from yards away caught it on video where they kind of get into like this verbal altercation and Jay Johnston starts antagonizing. Oh, that's These fun. African-American <laughs> men, knowing that he's about to do what he's about to do. So I went for a while not being able to watch the show. Fair. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I couldn't, I couldn't hear his voice. I was just, I was mourning what it, the potential loss of my brother. I was mourning not being able to be there with my family to support them. I was mourning the loss of this kind of like hero, not hero, that's a strong word, but somebody, somebody that was a part of a movie that I was so fucking proud of that had won awards that we had worked so fucking hard on. And now it just, it felt like it was all shattered it felt like this man and i found out later my partner told me that we were getting drinks together after the premiere at this open bar event that jay sat him on the couch and told him listen you're going to start to hear some stuff about me come out in the news soon he's like just please tell your girlfriend i said i'm sorry oh shit he fucking knew he Damn. knew he fucking knew so with that there's a part of me that with that movie there's like a disconnect. It's almost like he went there after he knew all of these people had poured our heart and souls into it. And a few weeks later, he flew or drew, I don't know, he might have drove, he might have flown to DC to be a part of this. The, he claimed at first, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know it was going to turn into this thing. Like I'm paraphrasing now. This is not a direct quote, please understand. But his basically his story was, I was just invited to this thing by some friends. I didn't know what all was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, you drove or flew or in some other ways traveled 3,000 fucking miles to be a part of it. And you're going to tell me you didn't know what you were going to be a fucking part of, dude? Really? So there was a bullshit excuse in the beginning. The fact that he hugged me that night at the bar after the movie. He took photos with me, smiling and laughing after this fucking movie premiere, knowing that I was about to find out what I was about to find out. So there's a part of me that will always be bitter towards him, angry towards him, embarrassed that he's in our fucking movie. And luckily the movie has not been canceled. It's not been boycotted. It's continued to win some awards at the film festivals. So I will just say to anybody who happens to want to watch Wing Dad, it's a great film. There's still a part of me that's proud of it. You'll have to forgive us. We did not know. None of us fucking had a clue. We were chatting with each other after the news broke. We found out that the FBI had been investigating Jay Johnston. They raided his house. They seized computers, a bunch of other stuff. Um, he has been completely canceled from the show. He's been essentially blacklisted. I haven't heard. His agent like fired him essentially. 
Um, to my knowledge, he has zero projects in the works because of his association with that event. So he is getting exactly what he deserved. He made this bed and he can fucking sleep in it. So if it ruins a movie that so many people, this just little group of people that stayed up long, cold winter nights in the mountain, freezing our fucking toes off, working our asses off for multiple hours every single day and night to make sure that this movie happened, just understand we're still proud of this movie. We will still stand behind it. We didn't know what Jay had done or what he was about to do. And it's just, it'll always be a heartbreak for me to associate my work and my love of Bob's Burgers with somebody that was a part of something that almost murdered my brother. So with that, um, after about a week or so ago, I started screening Bob's Burgers episodes and any episode that I already knew, because I have them pretty much all memorized, any episode that I knew Jay Johnston was going to be a voice of, I would skip it. Um, and that's difficult because I, I let it play in the background. I usually, it's just an afterthought. It's just playing. So I had to be very cognizant to not listen. And my partner and I had multiple talks about this, multiple talks. And he, you know, just, just very, very understanding. Like they got it. Like he, he was like, okay, whatever. Like he's always been irritated by the fact that I play this show so much and it's constantly in the background because he is not like a jibber jabby talky kind of guy. He's like a music in the background kind of guy. Yeah. So, you know, we've come to an understanding that he knows how much this show means to me and how much I need it. And he lets me have it. He just, he, he's like, okay, you, you got it. Just do what you got to do type of thing. So he understood and he was very angry and very sad because he was a producer and other like multiple other roles in this film and he was fucking proud of it and so we all felt betrayed we all felt betrayed by jay johnston so that and i'll let you insert anything you want to say here is my kind of like dark little tie-in <laughs> with bob's burgers so i guess what i would say is just um kind of to wrap that up is that because he played oh god wh which pistol was he he was the the dad right he, he played essentially the Andy Dick character. He played the father in our movie. Okay. But then on the show, on um, Boss Burgers, he's playing... Uh, he's playing uh, Oh. Yeah, so on, so I, I have to give the the, sh the the showrunners everyone credit on that because they they were on that pesto shit quick because I I'm, I'm in a couple I'm in a couple Bob's Burgers uh, groups on Facebook and I remember people uh, kind of going like oh my god did y'all hear that the guy who voices uh, Jimmy Pesto was at the insurrection I'm like oh shit and they. Yeah. And, they, it, you know, again, credit to the show. They were like, yeah, so he's not on the show anymore. Yeah, but, no, he's gone. He's gone. But he's gone. In a in a weird sort of way that feels like a Jimmy Pesto thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's actually a very common opinion, which is funny. It's like of all the characters on the Bob's Burgers show, the one fucker that would go to the insurrection would be Jimmy fucking Pesto. So... If anything, just to like try to hand out his shitty pizza. <laughs> yeah. So 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 I heard about it. I was like, that sucks. But I was like, also at the same time, like, yeah, that that kind of uh, okay. So it's it's kind of similar to like when I heard about the and I don't want to get sued the allegations against Kevin Spacey. I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, I can mm, see this. Yeah. I was like, yeah, this kind of tracks, honestly. Like, yeah, I mean, same with like um, Louis C.K. and multiple, multiple other people. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, what I guess I would say in regards to your in regards to your film is obviously there will always be that unfortunate component. But I hope that you and everyone else who worked on it can find solace in just the great work that you did. But I also can't imagine how hard it is to have that always be, you know, somewhat of a variable uh, in the art that you created. But um, but I hope you guys find solace in the experience and the actual, you know, in product. But that fucking sucks. <laughs> You know, so, so. Well, I, can I give? Okay, you said this is like we're okay to give spoilers, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So the first thing I thought of when I heard that there was going to be a movie, I'm like, holy shit! How are they going to handle Jimmy Pesto? Because it Bob's nemesis. He's yeah. been the catalyst for so many storylines. He's the father of Tina's biggest crush. You know, you know like J um, Andy and Ollie are like some of you know Louise's best friends, and they're some of the greatest. Sarah Silverman, her sister, are some of the greatest comic relief in the episodes that they're featured in so I'm like they can't just write it off and so for months I've been reading fan theories like either Jimmy's gonna just take off and his ex-wife is gonna take over the restaurant 
or, you know, the restaurant's going to close or the most popular, they're just going to get a different voice actor. So I, I was on pins and needles to see how his character was going to be represented, if at all, in the movie. And the fact that they showed during the backup thing, a song of um, like the intro song, basically. And all you saw was Jimmy Pesto outside his restaurant using his hose to water his sidewalk, which he always fucking does. And that was <laughs> it. That yeah. was all we saw of Jimmy Pesto. There was no voice. There was no interaction. There was no inclusion of him in the storyline, even with this big fucking sinkhole with a dead body in it. In front of in front of Bob's Burgers, a like, restaurant which Jimmy should have had a fucking field day with. The fact that that was all essentially the screen time that the Jimmy Pesto character got, in a way, it made me sad. But I was actually very okay with it. Yeah, they they it it didn't feel as jarring as I thought it would, which is something I have to give them credit for. Because so okay. To get to get to get to 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 the film itself, one of the things that made me laugh is that there will be people, of course, and I think we have to draw this comparison because someone has already asked me about how would you compare this versus Simpsons movie. And look, I'm a huge Simpsons fan, or was a huge Simpsons fan. The the, the show has been on for too goddamn long, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but but. <laughs> But one of the things that was funny about the Simpsons movie was the whole sinkhole aspect. And that's a plot line that is, you know, in here too. What I found really funny, because I, I went back and watched the Simpsons movie just for comparison, because I hadn't seen it in a little while. I was like, eh, right. rewatch it. So I go back and rewatch it, and it's really just used as a plot to get them, you know, out of the dome and, and off to Alaska and all that. The way it's used here to go ahead and tie to the kids because we of course have uh, we of course have Kristen uh, Kristen Shaw who plays Louise who as I mentioned is my favorite character uh, Eugene Merman plays Jean and then uh, Dan Mintz who plays Tina what I love about this movie is that each kid kind of has their own subplot in the sense of Louise is dealing with um, I'm blanking on the girl's name but uh, the girl oh, calls her Ormesh. thank you uh, the she calls her a baby and. You know, that's something that's been a reoccurring plot thread throughout the whole show. So Louise, you know, wanting to be tough, wanting to prove her prove her worth. And so the movie really puts that at the forefront there for her. And so when this whole sinkhole thing happens, first off, the actual fall that Louise takes, it's like at midnight. It's like in the middle of the night when she falls. It's a pretty intense fall when you're just kind of, yeah. you're going, oh, shit, okay. But then the way that this movie actually has a couple horror uh real horror moments where the skeleton pops up and she ends up uh, the, teeth, the teeth yeah so i have a huge thing with teeth just just in general like I, anytime i have a nightmare it feels like it's, it's teeth related i i hate that shit and so seeing <laughs> so seeing that made my skin genuinely crawl also it really does set up louise for God, I don't know if I want to say it's my favorite arc, but it probably is my favorite arc because Louise is my favorite character. And it's it's nice to see the kids. <sighs> okay, how do I want to put this? The kids aren't like aloof, but what I appreciate about the show and I've always appreciated about the show is that Bob and Linda, uh, I know we talked about H. John Benjamin, but John Roberts who plays Linda. One thing I've always appreciated about the show is that they let the kids be kids. Mm -hmm. And and I and I really love the show from the aspect alone that it tells your kids it's okay to be weird. And I really wish there was that more. One, it's sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, just, go ahead, go ahead. There's been so many references to the fact that Bob and Linda are like the opposite of helicopter parents, even to the point where Linda was like, she told Mr. Fronder, I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Fronder in an episode, and of course I'm blanking on the exact one. She's like, we don't know all the crap our kids get into. And Bob was like, we don't want to know. And then yeah. there was another <laughs> there was another episode completely separate like season where bob was like kind of awkward conversation at like the breakfast table and he is like so like how do you guys know what's going on at school do you guys like school i don't i don't think i've ever asked you that like it's just they're so like not 
present in that way, but it's like, they just let the kids off. The kids walk to school, they have their lives. And usually it is going back to what you were saying about Tina and, or excuse me, Louise and her arc. It almost felt like when the tooth fell into her fucking mouth, the audience in the theater that I was at lost it. Grown men were like, Oh, like everybody had some kind of an auditory response to it. And previously what we've seen in shows is that every episode, some character has, you have the kids have their arcs and the parents have their arcs usually in the restaurant. And it's like simultaneous storytelling. But usually it is Louise as the forefront, her siblings as a support. Jean as the forefront, his siblings as a support. And so the same thing with Tina. But in this instance, and I think it's really because they had the time to play around with it, is that all of the kids had their own things going on. And we've never really seen that in an episode before. And so that was fucking awesome. And for me, the moment that that tooth fell into uh, like Louise's fucking mouth, it was almost like something in her changed in that moment. That was almost like a, we now know after this movie, Louise is probably never going to be the same. And that was so fucking impactful. It, it, it really is because, you, you know, so it does the whole thing, you know, where it's like, do the kids, do the kids ever really age? No, they don't shut up. But for as <laughs> much, but for as much as the kids, you know, can age, this feels like this takes them in the most quote mature unquote direction. I think you can, because the movie does this great trick where it kind of tells you, oh, you know, Louise got her ears because of this reason. And I went, oh, okay. Like I actually totally buy that. That totally makes sense. And uh, I've talked about this on the show before. Uh, I don't know when I started crying more. Like the, the it used to be a way hard. Ten years ago, it was much harder for me to cry. Now a fucking sunset will make me cry. Like it takes so little to make me cry. Like I'll I'll watch a cat video. I watched a cat video this morning about this guy who discovered a kitten. And I just and I just start bawling. I was like, oh my god, we gave our cats our for, their forever home. Oh my god, we're such good. Like I, I it takes very little when I when the movie lays out how Louise's ears are tied to Bob's mom, who they don't talk about too often on the show. So the fact they bring her up, I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. But in the way that they tied into her ears and what that actually means was something that <laughs> that I started crying. I started crying a little bit. And then just more as it goes on and how Bob's like, you know, you're so much more like her and how I know you guys would have been, you know, close. That's when the waterworks just... I was like, oh, Jesus. And, and I just, and I could not hold in all of the, all of the, the feels as the kids say. And that was something that by the end of the movie, everything that the kids go through, it really does feel like that moment's earned. To your point as well, there is usually that point, like you said, of, you know, Bob and Linda are at the, are at the restaurant, they have their arc, and then, you know, kids have their thing. The movie does a really good job of actually interweaving the two so that by the time you get to the, you know, the last 20 minutes or so, I went, oh, okay, this actually felt like a very natural progression to go uh, to go ahead and get here. Um, before I get, before we get back on, you know, the kids and everyone, I want to talk about Teddy real quick because uh, that's Larry Murphy who plays Teddy. All right, so hold on. Can I interject here just because I don't want to lose thoughts and I have no, no, some? No. Go, go, go. Okay, book, bookmark Teddy. Do not forget what you're going to say about Teddy because yes, please, let's talk about Teddy. So a couple of points. Um, one of the things that I was nervous about with this movie is the story. The movie, as much as I love the characters and I love like my history with them and how much I love them, if the story just felt kind of slapped together and shitty and just elongated for the sake of being a feature length film, I was very cognizant that that was a possibility because again, I had avoided so many spoilers and I really wanted to form my own opinion going into it. Yeah. I will say that the story as a standalone story was fucking brilliant. It had its, it had so many strong moments. It had the mystery, it had the emotion, it had the humor, it had the tie-ins with all of the characters, Mr. Fish Odor, um, Calvin Fish Odor, like even the fucking cousin, like who honestly, I, I kind of did see coming a little bit, but I think most of us did the process yeah. of elimination. Um, but the, the fact that the story in and of itself was so strong and so entertaining and never felt like it was being dragged out is a huge, huge testament to the writers. And I appreciate so much the obvious work that they poured into this, the heart that they poured into it, respect for the characters and the history of the show and the fans, all of it to me felt like all of it was there and all of it was respected and it was amazing. Um, 
pause because I had another point about the kids and it just slipped my fucking mind. Oh no, no, no. Okay. Unpause. I got it. The one part, and I was a little teary eyed at some of it. And I'm, I'm been known to be a crier during really emotional movies or television shows or commercials. So like, I will cry sometimes at films is what I'm trying to say. Um, the scene where tiny baby toddler Bob is walking hand in hand with his mother and the camera pans up and we see her face. Yeah. That's, that's when I lost it. She has never been shown Yes, not. She, she's been referenced in my mind to major times. There has been references to her in the past, but the two major times that Bob's mother has been referenced is by his father in that episode where he goes to help his dad out during his Christmas like party. But the, according to Bob, is it really a party if you're just serving customers? Isn't that just kind of working? And you which know, when Linda, he put which when he points it out, he went, "Yeah, that's completely." Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but Linda was like Christmas magic, you know, like she was determined she was going to bring these two together. And like, she was, you know, all about it. And Gene with his rolling in beans and like acting like he was a pig, like try to catch me. Nobody's trying to catch me. You know, so it was a great fucking episode. It's a great goddamn episode. But when his dad says, you know, it's been tough without your mom here. And for some people that could have been conveyed of, did, did Bob's mom leave? Is she dead? Like it was never really clarified. And then the other Christmas episode, sensing a theme here, when Bob meets with Mr. Fish Odor to be a part of his gingerbread contest oh, with God. all of his other like, you know, rich guy, old guy friends. And he, he basically, they ask like, you know, have you ever, he asked, Mr. Fish Odor asked him like, do you have... So I'm again, I'm paraphrasing, um, but something to the effect of like, have you ever built a gingerbread house or do you have any experience building gingerbread houses? And Bob's response was, well, yeah, actually, that was kind of my mother's nice thing before she died. Like we used to do gingerbread houses together. And so that was the first major time that what happened to Bob's mom was dropped. And so that was just very emotional. So because she's kind of referenced in those two episodes, and I want to say maybe like a whisper of her and a couple others, the fact that we actually got to see Bob's mother's face and she was wearing her pink hat, like Louise's pink bunny ears during that whole scene about why, you know, she, Linda made her those ears. That was when I fucking lost it. That's when the movie got me. Yeah, it, it's it's one of those things. So one thing that I've always I've always said, you, you don't need to lay out every single thing for your audience. Sometimes you need to trust your audience to just connect the dots. And because you can over explain. It's like, oh, yes. I, you, you don't always need to do that. And to your point, they've referenced her, you know, those couple major times. I feel like they've mentioned her maybe three or four times just kind of in passing. But but to have that connection to trust your audience like that, now that means that we have that connection of not just Bob's mom to Bob, but 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 Bob, uh, Bob's mom to, to Louise moving forward. And that's something that, you know, they could, you know, they could reference obviously later on down the road if they want to. Or not reference. It's not something you have to hammer home. But that was such a powerful moment, not just for Bob and for, you know, obviously what we get to see, but for Louise as a character as well. And it's one of those things where uh, it made me think of the, you know, of the Fluies episode where she's just, you know, where she's sick and she's going through it. And I'm so uh, angry at her family for Milton Kuchikopi and then like, um, Teddy giving him boobs. Yeah, and, and, oh yeah, that's right. I forgot Teddy give, but but you know that's a that's a growing moment. Uh, that's a growing moment for Louise as well. So the show's done a really good job of giving her these almost these little these uh, bottle episodes where she's a, where we're able to go ahead and get you know more background and get uh, exposed more to her. The thing for me that just made me really happy as far as the villain because you you already referenced it it wasn't a huge shock when you figure out who the villain is but the show always his actually i'm gonna phrase that the show's never been shy about the fish holders being shady as fuck and oh my god mr fish holder and like his references to arson and just like like illegal or like fake lawyer things that he gives to his carnies and like the carny fights oh my god mr fish holder is amazing but he's fucking horrible yeah he's like, also voiced by one of my favorite actors of all time kevin klein yeah i so kevin klein god bless you sir um apparently he's really nice because i got to talk to oh god one of the animators and i'm blanking on her name i'm so fucking sorry but she called in to the uh the place where we used to work and she did an order and she was amazing but one thing i love about 
Mr. Fish showed her is that he dresses like an old Bond villain, like with the eye patch, with the eye patch and the white suit, and it's it's wonderful. He's always riding around in something that's not like a traditional car. Like he's either in like a like a carnival ride or it's uh, it's <laughs> like it's such a, it's usually the golf cart. It's he's such. Like, Sometimes my golf cart doesn't start just like yours. It's such a subtle thing, but it's one of those things that always makes me laugh because it's just, it's just that little bit of extra that you would need if you're if you're a fish owner. And and I can't remember what episode this is that I'm about to reference, but Louise throws this retort at fish owner like, "You should teach at her school." And without missing a beat, and he goes, "Oh, and you should work in my landmine. Uh, you no, should work in no, my mines. you should work and you should work in my coal mines." Yeah, and he goes, "Okay, bye." And I'm like, "Wait a minute, what the fuck?" <laughs> Yes, yes, and that I, I, yes, that's such an amazing moment. And I remember that very distinctly because there was another tie into that where there's another episode where they're talking about children who used to work in coal mines and be covered in coal. And Louise goes, Lucky, yeah, and it's uh, and, like the show does that a good amount with fish odor. And just the more the show goes on, the less it tries to hide it, which makes the joke funnier because there's that whole um underground. Uh, gambling episode where Bob, you know, wins with scissors by splitting open his stitches, which is so goddamn gross. But Bob, your your finger looks like a seventies porno. <laughs> but, but the fact Fish Odor is willing to steal from children is just something I I love, Mister Fish Odor. And so seeing this more of him and uh, Felix, who's voiced by Zach Galifianakis, who that was a that was a casting choice that they when they introduced uh, Felix because that's the other thing that people forget there is the Wonder Wharf uh, two parter where Felix is willing to kill the family and then has that because change of his of, girlfriend Fanny yeah who's willing to, but has that change of heart the fact that we get Grover Fishoder which again you can kind of see you can kind of see coming but the fact he's I okay I appreciate when my villains have no sense of morality and they're willing to kill children I understand how fucked up that sounds but if you're really a villain like don't draw the line at kids like be that piece of shit and the fact that Grover's like oh man you put this together kids well all right you guys are off the map now it's like wow that is that's dark and I weirdly appreciate that about the show because it felt uh, or about the movie because it gave it more gave it more weight it gave it more of a maturity that I'll be honest I wasn't expecting heading into this because I watched the one trailer and that's it like I, I've been avoiding spoilers like the plague because uh, I saw this this past uh, Saturday and I actually didn't have anything spoiled for me somehow I was actually able to avoid all spoilers going in which hooray but but Grover Fishoder being the villain, his his plan, <laughs> the fact that you're going to have a bunch of uh, stuffed animals light on fire, I just went, wow, that is weirdly fucked up that you're going <laughs> to... But gonna... it's perfect because it, it showed that he was he was literally just utilizing all of the stuff that was around Wonder Wharf anyway. And it does, act, to me, it spoke a lot to the Fishoders are such a toxic family. Absolutely. That even Fanny, when, like, and she's still, apparently, even though she, like, was hauled off to prison after that two-parter, at the end of that two-parter, because of her role in, you know, attempting to, like, take down the family and kill them under the bridge, like, when they're all on their paddle boats and shit. And she's like, you, everybody, get in the water and start drowning already. And then she was mad because they just started telling each other they love each other. And like, oh, you guys are so bad at drowning. But of course, it's voiced by Jordan Peele, who I fucking love. And so, like, I loved the Fanny character. I fucking loved her. But she's so much like Grover in that she doesn't give a fuck who she who she crosses, even if it's children, because she's so determined to get what she wants. But it makes sense that she's so horribly, obviously abusive to Felix who is so forgiving and living in denial because he's just so excited to have a 29 year old girlfriend who's a singer that he's willing to put up with this but she's so much like Grover who's their cousin so it makes sense it's like even Felix is sticking in his comfort zone with this abusive partner because he's a used he's so used to living his life with these horrible abusive villainous people that's a really wow that's actually a really damn yeah I actually didn't think about it like that I did not know that was Jordan Peele and that makes me even happier that, that, <laughs> No, he definitely, like he absolutely voices Fanny. I he love does. him in 
Linda. And she's like, she's like, look what Felix bought me. And she's like blinking at Linda. And he's like, she's like, what, your eyes? And he's like, the lashes, blink, 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 blink. And then she's talking about how she wore, how she got a tube top, but she's going to wear it as a dress because it'll show her butt. Like she's just so- Oh, that's right. <laughs> so flamboyant and so amazing and I like who's that knocking at your door oh it's Mr. Dance Floor and like I just I know everything about that those two fucking episodes I have them memorized because I love her Sarah just so much so, so fucking good um outside of that uh we talked about Louise I do want to talk so what the big overarching quote message unquote for the for the show that I really love and it's one of the reasons I actually tell people like once your kids you know if you have kids and they hit 12 13 first off your your kids who are 12 13 are way more insane gross than you can ever imagine so showing them the show is not gonna <laughs> not gonna fuck them up anymore uh Plus, your kids go to public school. They have way more to worry about. But, uh, but but independent of that, one thing I love about this show is that it shows that it's okay to not be the best at shit. Like, Bob has these aspirations of grandeur. Like, he wants to be, you know, Emerald or, oh, wow, I'm dating myself. Um, he wants to be, you know... Um, Gordon Ramsay without being an asshole. He wants to go ahead and, you know, like, be making burgers for, you know, the, the, the elite. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and, and what I've really always appreciated about the show is that the show goes, it's okay to just have your thing. You don't have to be famous for doing it. And that really ties in with Gene because, you know, Gene is playing fucking, you know, fart sounds on his uh, on his keyboard. And the name of his band in this movie, the Itty Bitty Diddy Committee, that I got such a hard goddamn laugh out of that. I'm like, okay, that's wonderful. And we've seen Gene perform a little bit. Like, you know, I on Mac think of the uh, the tops the episode. That's top five episodes for me. Like the first time I heard Electric Love, I remember going, this is a weirdly inspired song. <laughs> and I get it. Dude, I was working at the company that we used to work at together and I was on chat and I would play that on my phone and I would talk to other people about it. I would play that segment of that episode on repeat because I would get goosebumps over the harmonies and the tone of that song. Fucking beautiful. But like it's 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 a weirdly well done weirdly well done song. And then I think about the uh how he turns Die Hard into a musical, which is so goddamn funny. And Die Hard the musical is one of my oh my god. Die hard or die try or try harder. What is it? Hold on. Work harder. Work harder die, die, die trying girl. girl. Yeah. Yeah. And and honestly, now when I watch Die Hard, I always kind of just go like, man, like Bruce Willis should be singing. And then I just start laughing because Bob Why is Burger. no one singing? Why is no one dancing? <laughs> but, but, but seeing Gene have this whole like, I want to, you know, I want to play music. I want to have a band. And the way that people really do weird, like Gene weirdly inspires people around him artistically and the fact that this movie really does end with him getting a chance to actually perform, even though it's only in front of a few people, I thought that was a really beautiful moment and something it that was. I went, that I was like, good for Gene. I'm happy that he got this moment because one of the, the complaints that I've always seen levied from people who are just, I think, fucking dumb in regards to the show is when it comes to Tina, and I'll be, and again, I, as I just said, like, if you're a 12 year old, oh my fucking God, like you, 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 you are having thoughts very similar to Tina, whether, you know, like I could, yeah, you're having those thoughts. And so having it come from a fe- from a female perspective, A, is horribly healthy and something that we should be seeing more. So it's not seen as taboo, but that's a whole other rant I could go on. Yeah, um, we can talk about the Red movie all day long there. It, yeah, it, it, exactly. But B, her... <sighs> How do I put this? She's always had a thing for Jimmy, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Peso Jr. That's always been like, that's always been her guy that, you know, it's kind of the whole will they, won't they. I always want her to, uh, I always thought she would end up with Josh just because like Josh actually seems like Josh actually, you know, gives a shit. But the, I'll be like, I'll say it. The more I see her and Zeke together, I don't know if they would be a thing, but I just love Zeke so much. And if there is a small complaint I could levy against this movie, I would have liked to have seen Zeke in some capacity, but I don't know if that's something they're setting up for or that's something that just won't ever develop. But I just love, one of my favorite episodes is the one where he uh, dresses up as a mascot at his uh, his mom. For, uh, for his grandmother's grandma. surgery. Yeah, I that is 
Oh God, I don't know if that would break top five for me. That's definitely top ten episode for me though. And I was something I was like, I would have liked to have seen Zeke just because again, like, I, and we do get a little bit of him in here, but I'm just such a fan of that character. I was a little bummed I didn't get a little more Zeke. But again, with a show with this many characters, I I acknowledge that that's me. You know, that's something I want that didn't necessarily need to be there. But I could have used a little more Zeke. But um. But I really like Tina's, I like Tina's journey. I hope, and I'll just say this as a fan of the show, I hope that she understands, it feels like she understands her worth more independent of Jimmy Jr. when the movie ends. Like, that's what I took from it. Um, From your perspective, like, where did you kind of feel about Tina as far as like where she kind of ended up? Okay, so I... Okay, I like Jimmy Jr. as just like a separate boy character. I love his interaction, his deep, deep connection and friendship with Zeke. I will say in regards to Tina, he's a piece of shit. He's toxic. He's a red flag. Yep. She should drop him completely. Yep. He has fucked her over and abandoned her so many fucking times. Like I could literally reference multiple episodes, but we don't have to. Like he's just in regards to Tina. I just, I know I want her to have such a strong attraction or a passion for somebody else as she forgets all about him but the problem is with tina as has been very well established is she just loves every boy her age up to 18 years old like so yeah. he's, he's her he's her reoccur- like a reoccurring crush and that was established in what episode two of season one where she has her 13th birthday party which to date is the only active actual birthday party we've seen for the kids even though we have had linda's birthday and we have had bob's birthday but we've only ever seen the one active birthday party for one of the kids that they actually aged out in the show and that was tina's 13th so that was like established that she has this massive crush on jimmy jr to the point where if he can't come to her party she doesn't even want one so t- uh, the, t- and the tina and josh aspect was cute but that one tappity 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 tap 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 episode if that taught us anything it was they are friends their arc is done it's a friendship thing and that's it yeah. i love that there's been references that Zeke considers himself a potential suitor for Tina when they're older, even to a point where she lets him go as hall monitor. And he's like, I'm going to tell our kids about this. You think that ain't going to happen, girl, but it is like, you know, he's, and then she's kissed him a couple of times and like, you know, random where she's in like full blown panic thinking that aliens were going to destroy the planet. So there's been times where she and Zeke have kind of had that quasi connection, but in my mind, I have always seen Tina meeting her significant other as a young adult, either in college or past college. And it's going to be somebody that none of us even expected. It could be a female, it could be non-binary because that's just Tina. She's just so open-minded and granted, yes, in her 13 year old hormonal state, she's obsessed with boys. It's boys, it's butts, it's horses, it's zombies. That's all she's focused on. It's her erotic, you know, friend fiction. It's all she thinks about. So to me, in my mind, it would be the funniest fucking play of fate for her to either fall in love with a woman or a non-binary person as she's like graduating college or like out in the world doing her own thing. Because that even Bob has not alluded to who she's going to be with, but he's even alluded to her as when she's a young adult. So I feel like as far as Tina, Tina has not met her significant other, her, her real significant other. She just hasn't. Okay. Um, Gene to me has always seemed like he is totally on the fence. His sexuality is completely open. He's yes. had references to his vagina. He's had references to, you know, having a crush on um, the little girl that sucks on her necklace. I'm, of course, blanking on her name because now I'm two glasses of wine in. Courtney, Courtney Wheeler. Um, yeah. So he, Gene has, and Gene has been every type of representation of a, a sexual, you know, like um, appetite throughout the board without obviously being sexualized because he's 11. So Gene is up in the air. I'm leaning towards Gene's just straight up gay. Like Gene's just gonna date dudes. And I'm okay with that. Well, conversely, Louise, full blown lesbian. Like she's had her crush on, well, not even really a crush. She's been hyper protective of Rudy to the point where she hates Chloe Barbash because Chloe Chloe Barbash 
is the girl that Rudy has a crush on. And she got really jealous that Valentine's Day episode to the point where she gave Rudy his first kiss because he was so upset that Chloe wasn't going to come out and give him one. But I don't think she did it because she actually has feelings for him. I think she's doing it because she's super protective of him and she loves him so much as a friend and they've had multiple adventures together. But Louise, she is such an independent, free-thinking, strong-willed person. I do not see Louise settling for anything or anyone less than the person she deems is the perfect fucking partner in crime for her. And because she is only nine, this could go a long ways. But I truly feel as an adult, Louise is just going to be full on lesbian only dating females. So that's just kind of how I picture the kids and their sexuality and their like future choices based on everything we've been presented with over the past number of years. I could see Louise at an Annie DeFranco concert very easily. Like I could see, <laughs> I could see that. By the way, if you have not listened to Annie DeFranco, she's got some great shit, but. Yeah, you're, uh, you're missing out. Um, all right, I'm gonna go through a couple rapid fire uh, uh, jokes here and then we'll get out of fine. here. So, okay, fine. So one of my favorite jokes, and I can't tell you why it hit me the way it did, but it just, I, I was laughing about it after like five minutes later. So Sergeant Bosco has always been one of my favorite characters. Yes, just because yes. I, because he just he's such a dick to Bob and and really to the kids too like the the whole um, the whole hostage episode uh with uh uh, uh Bill Hader uh Mickey um and you know he's going he's it's my dad it's my dad and then you know her uh Bosco stepping on Louise's foot to get the phone back it's like god damn dude <laughs> Hey, listen, Mickey, you said you were a bank robber. And he's like, hey, let me talk to the girl. Let me talk to the girl or I shoot a hostage. So yeah, like, he's he's a total dick. The, so there's this point where they're trying to go ahead and you know solve this, uh solve the whole mystery of the sinkhole and everything, because they're trying to save the restaurant, you know, save the rec center. And they go ahead and they sneak into his his car. So first off, dirt cop joked, he goes, Hey kids, you're not supposed to speak up on cops. We're the ones who are supposed to sneak up on you, which I went, oh my god, that's really like ooh. It was fucking dark, but so funny. Yeah, like like accurate, funny, but damn, okay. So he goes ahead and kicks them out of the car and <laughs> And he goes ahead and says, run off kids and go catch tadpoles or something. And I don't know why that line landed for me the way it did, but it's such an old man out of touch thing to say to tell kids to go catch tadpoles. And even Louise stops. It's like tadpoles. Like, yeah, you heard me. She's like, Louise doesn't even have a comic because she's so fucking confused that of all the things you could tell a kid to go do, that catching tadpoles was the first thing he landed on. And I I honestly almost fell out of my seat. I thought that was one of the funniest got there. That's one of the funniest, hardest laughs I've had all year. So Bob's Burgers movie, thank you so much for that. Um, oh God, I had a, a oh God, I had another couple ones. Um I can't I remember. For me, it wasn't. It wasn't even that that line was as funny as it was because honestly, it was funny to me. Like I kind of chuckled, but it didn't get me the way it got you. The way it got me is that literally these kids rolled up on their fucking bikes to a cop car that still has his light on, still says police on stuff. So he's obviously sitting outside of a fucking biker bar trying to see if they're the ones guilty for committing fucking murder. These kids roll up on bikes. He kicks them out and tells them to go away outside of a fucking biker bar that he's trying to do a sting on. It's not like, holy shit, you guys, this is your children. This is dangerous. Let me drive you home. It was no, go catch tadpoles or something. Like he well, does I, not. I did not even think about that. <laughs> Oh my god, that, that's a really fair point. Like, I mean, luckily they know the one-eyed snakes, but yes, that is a very insanely like yeah, irresponsible Bosco, as fuck. Bosco doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> like, that's a yeah, no, that's a fair point. I wow, I did not even think about that. God, that's that weirdly darker. Um, but so so there's that joke. Um, I can't remember. I think gene says it um i can't remember if he's talking to an i assume he's talking to an adult but uh but he goes like uh oh what is this oh my sweet old oh he's talking to fish owner he goes like what is this and he goes oh my sweet old organ and he goes oh your wiener and just the movie brushes right past it i just went oh jesus christ movie this is fucking amazing but uh, any time that there's fish odor on a screen you will get jokes like that 
And like, yes, Gene is actually famous for them, even to the point where he's referenced wanting to be able to crawl back up Linda's vagina because he, didn't, <laughs> he wasn't ready to be born yet. There's just like really dark, like adult jokes. And I will say, I have spent countless hours over the past number of months watching this show with my partner's nine-year-old son. That kid fucking loves this show. He'll look up at his dad and he'll be like, does daddy, can we please watch Bob's Burgers? He doesn't ask me because he knows the answer is going to be yes. He asks his daddy because he knows his daddy like finds the show irritating, but like, he's not going to say no to his kids. And he's like, sure, buddy, just put the show on. So like my, nine years old and he connects with the jokes. He laughs at them every once in a while. He looks at me kind of quizzically, like, what did, what did that joke mean? And sometimes I'm like, here, it's kind of over your head, but I'll explain it. Other times I'm like, you'll understand when you're older. Yeah. There, there are going to be a lot of these jokes. If you're, if you're younger that you're just going to miss and you're going to go, Oh, when you're like 17, 18, you're going, Oh, wow. That's, that's way funnier now. Um, oh God, what else? Um, I've only got a couple minutes here. So I'm going to throw a couple more. The um the song that the Carnies sing is a fucking amazing uh, musical number. That was something that I um I, I'm blanking on the name of the song, but that number in particular was something I went. This is horribly well choreographed. It's horribly well animated. Um, oh, so much so. And and in the animation for this movie, because I I mean I know some people kind of go like, does this really need to be a movie? And I mean honestly, I'd say not really. But the thing that I one of the things I love about it is that the animation feels enhanced, but it doesn't feel like it loses what makes the show so special. It feels like a like a progressive upgrade for what you get to see on a weekly basis. So it doesn't feel out of place, but you do see where the money definitely went. You're like, oh, okay. But it never feels jarring, which is a very tough balance to, to strike, but I think the movie does a really great job of. The uh, opening number, uh, Sunny Side Up Summer, I was already tearing up listening to that because because it's let's call it what it is bob just has such bad luck sometimes yeah. with the restaurant to see him being optimistic which he rarely is at points and and being hopeful and the way that linda and bob do lift each other up as a couple even though they get into their you know misadventures and all that it really is sweet and it's really inspired and it really was something i went man this this show just knows when to pull the heartstrings and when not to and when to turn up the lights and when not to. It's a very fine-tuned machine at this point where, I mean, it's going on to season, oh God, what, season 13? I think we're hitting on. Uh, yeah, and it was it was renewed for another two or three seasons. So yeah, I cheered when I found that out. Which is, you know, insane. And then, um, uh, but that opening number worked so incredibly well for me. Um, another couple of jokes I'll throw out. Uh, they keep referencing the sinkhole as a crime hole. And that was just, that was an ongoing joke that just had me constantly giggling. Um, the joke about Wonder Wharf, once uh, they accuse Mr. Fishholder of being the criminal, the movie basically stops and pauses and goes, people don't seem to mind going to a park by owned by a murderer, which considering Bob's Burgers is now part of Disney... Um, <laughs> I'm not saying they're referencing the uh, Disneyland, but yeah, come on. They, they're definitely yeah, the, referencing. The irony is not lost. Yeah, it, it's it's very deliberately done. Um, oh yeah, Teddy. That was the thing I wanted to reference. Teddy is, I'll be nice and say very intense when it comes to his relationship, uh, his friendship with Bob. Um, he 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 loves that family, like to a fault, I would say, but he he loves that family. And once the sinkhole goes ahead and starts fucking with Bob's business, because of course he has seven days to go ahead and pay the bank. I weirdly found it sweet the way Teddy went ahead and you know, Frankenstein, this mobile Bob's Burgers cart for them to use. It's It does show just why Teddy is such a genuine person and why he loves the family so much. And it was actually really sweet. There was a, a couple, a couple rows back, I heard him go like, oh, like when he did that, I kind of looked by and I was like, oh, okay, like that that hit for people okay right on like it again it's it's something you see in the trailer but it is a weirdly sweet moment it does show why teddy you know is is who he is um i'm gonna throw out one last thing before i throw it to you for just a few more a uh, few more thoughts in case you had anything else you wanted to bring up um oh gosh i had it here the fact that jimmy pesto jr is still trying to catch the nugget in his mouth is such a wonderful reference that i just went wow you're going all the way back to that i really appreciate that and there's and there's way more stuff we could talk about but again we only have so much time but 
if you've been a fan of the show from the beginning, there's so much here for you. And and I'll be that person. I don't think this is a dick thing to say, but I'll say it anyway. I don't think this movie is going to really convert you if you just don't like the show. But to be honest, it's not here to convert you. <laughs> like, this is a movie for fans of the show or even casual fans of the show. And it does feel like a reward to the fan base for supporting the show for as long as, uh, for as long as, as uh, you know, we have. And this is something I look horribly forward to watching again uh I, I mentioned i cried at the start of the movie i cried at the end of the movie and i laughed throughout the whole movie i was always entertained i was always having fun um, my, uh, my partner and i got to go see it together and i'm so happy we got to and just walking out of the theater uh our theater was about half full we saw this uh, like on a saturday around like two o'clock um but as we were walking out people were just like man i had so much fun with that and at the end of the day as we are slowly starting to get back out in the world and summer is, you know, raging, I would say you'll, at worst, you'll have fun with this. Like, I, I can't tell someone that you won't have fun with this because I think you will have fun with this. So, um, I'm going to give, uh, I'll just, fuck it, I'll give my grade now so I kind of wrapped up. I'm going to give this a solid A. This is something I'm definitely going to be buying. Uh, this is a day one buy for me. I mean, it's a Bob Burgers movie. Of course, I'm going to fucking own this. But um, I might go see this again in theaters before it pieces out. Like, like I, I might go see this again since I've seen it already. Uh, catch the jokes that I, you know, missed when I was laughing and or crying. But I had so much fun with this. This was well worth their wait, you know, delays because of COVID and everything. But I had so much fun with this. I'm happy people are, are, uh, are digging on it. Uh, I say it all the time, Rotten Tomatoes is not gospel, so in case you care, uh, it's an 87% on Rotten Tomatoes, it's a 90% audience score, so people are digging this, so um, it's well worth your time, please go see if you get a chance. Uh, Cassandra, I'll throw it back to you for your final thoughts on the film, uh, what you liked, and uh, your final grade. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so um, final thoughts. Going back to what you were saying about the animation, it was immediately you notice, if you've been watching the show for a while, the, the first thing you notice is the use of shadows. Um, there were so many shadows and little bitty notches in the wall and damages and dings and dents in the kitchen and in the counter setup that we don't usually see in the show. So it was obvious that the movie was trying to drive home the point that, yeah, this, this is a restaurant that's been running for a while. There's not a lot of money being put into repairs. This is obviously a little bit of a financial struggle situation. So there, there were hints to that, which I appreciated. And again, you would only really notice if you've been watching the show. Yeah. Um, so I, I appreciated that kind of throwback to like, I wouldn't call it fan service because fan service is usually just they're throwing us a bone for the sake of being fans. But this was true appreciation and homage to those of us who have been you know, rooting for the show for a long time. The fluidity of the animation, pretty much from start to finish, gorgeous especially notice during Linda's like first initial dance in the kitchen when she's like gearing Bob up. The only other time I've seen it that super fluid was a Christmas episode where the kids were trying to catch Santa by putting a Christmas wrist wreath for oh, yeah. And yeah. they got stuck in the car in the snow being haunted, or well, not haunted, but being chased rather by this candy cane Christmas truck by this lonely truck driver. But they caught Teddy, essentially. Bob asked him to go and check on the ham. Teddy made a big deal about it. And then he decided to help himself to a snack. And he put his hand through the Christmas for three and got stuck. And the way he thrashes around and the refrigerator like shakes and falls, it was one of the most fluid. It was like a literal fish out of water flopping motion that just still to this day is a brilliant moment of animation for me and I feel like that translated into this movie for almost every scene so I loved loved the animation I will pair it this is not a movie that is going to immediately turn you into a fan if you've never seen the show and I know that for a fact because I went with my niece who was basically we were just going because she wanted to hang out like she was you know willing to go just to see a movie with me so we could hang out together and she was like well I tried watching the first episode which is most of the fans know was a pilot episode that was an homage to the original story arc which was supposed to be this was a show about cannibals the bro the belchers were supposed to be cannibals which is why it was funny that they were being accused of serving human flesh because of the rumor that Louise started and that's how we get to know Hugo and the history with Linda that builds up throughout the rest of the show but um, 
without knowing that like, that's all she knew about Bob's Burgers. And she still enjoyed the movie. She laughed at some parts, you know, she could felt the emotional tug, but it's nothing that she was like, oh my God, I'm going to go back and I'm going to binge the whole series now. She was just like, that was really fun. That was really fun. I'm really glad that we saw that. And I personally absolutely will be seeing it at least a second time. Um, and I don't usually see movies multiple times in the theater. I wait till they come out. But this one absolutely warrants multiple viewing if you're that big of a fan. And again, I'll go back and say that this was not fan service. This was an homage. This was people that truly love these characters as much as we do. And they did us a great, great service in building out this, um, this really intense, amusing, entertaining story building on characters that we already love while staying true to their original personalities. I love that they touched on when, you know, they were in the car, they were almost being buried. They thought they were going to die. And Bob has his whole little moment where he talks about Linda, like how she's always the one who's positive and always building up. And it's true. Linda's always been to a, to a point where being annoying sometimes Linda's always been yeah. that incredibly <laughs> positive pushing Bob in the right direction you know muse dance uh, 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 uh. like she's always <laughs> seen herself as like Bob's muse and that's truly what she is and even sometimes like at one point where she's like in the kitchen dancing being all annoying and Louise was like well how about that dad that's your bride and Bob was like well you get what you get you know so it's like they're not even, they're not even always like at one point when Mr. Fish Oder comes in for that Thanksgiving episode, and he's like, you've ever been in love, Bob? And Bob's like, well, I mean, I, I guess I technically am. So it's like they don't consider themselves this super romantic couple, but they're partners. They're true lifelong partners that have worked tirelessly together to build this restaurant, to build their family, to build a future, to just be happy and just survive. And the one overarching message of the show, and I know you touched on it before, but I will kind of elaborate a little bit, is that this is not a show where you see them always winning. They rarely win. The Belchers rarely win. The Belchers are a poor family that own a barely thriving restaurant in a partially dying tourist oceanside town they don't have wins they don't win the minivan during a show they don't you know they don't win the approval of the bank and loans you know they don't get to keep the money that the mickey the bank robber has slipped bob because the dye pack went off and like everybody thinks that bob actually even his family thinks that bob actually stole that money so they are not the winning family but in that it makes them so real and so relatable and so tangible. And I think that's one of the reasons that I connect with them as deeply as I do, is there's just a reality to them and their personalities that you don't often see. They don't get the fairy tale endings. It's very rare that anything really positive or life-changing happens. Even when Bob's best friend from school shows up and gives Bob $100,000 to be a partner, Bob can't handle the changes to the to the as the, the aesthetics of his restaurant and he forcibly gives that money back and he's still friends with him at the end of the episode but it's so it's i love love that about them and this is carried on in the movie i think the movie is absolutely beautiful in moments funny just funny in other moments doesn't drag on is truly entertaining i saw it with There was maybe a third of the people in the seats filled in this tiny little tavern, um, little theater that I saw it with my niece in in Fort Worth. But people were laughing and they were responding and they were ooing and aahing over the moments that meant the most. And it was just a beautiful experience to watch it with people that you knew were there because of a shared love of the show and these characters. So all praise, all praise go to the show, the cast, the crew, everybody that worked so hard to make it such a beautiful experience. And this movie for me, absolute A, no question. I will own it the moment it is on streaming and on the shelves. Right on. Um, Yeah, everyone, please go support this movie. Um, I know the new Dumb Dinosaur movie comes out this week, which God fucking damn it, I'm so mad. (laughs) Like, 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 I've been bitching about this all day, and like, it's, f- I, and I know some people go, "Why do you have to go see?" It? It's a new release. People if you run a podcast. That's how it fucking works. I don't want to go see the shit, but, eh. but, yeah, but it's Chris Pratt, though. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I might go see. Bo- I might go see Bob's Burgers after that, just to get the taste out of my mouth. <laughs> but, but, um, but I digress. Um, Cassandra, thank you so much for being on. Um, you are. 
you are welcome on whenever you want to talk about Bob Birds or anything <laughs> else. Um, last question I will throw out to you real quick because you are a fan. If you had to tell someone who's never seen the show to watch one episode, what episode would you throw at them? Oh, see, that's difficult for me because I am so emotionally connected to so many. Okay, um, quick thought here. You might need to actually eliminate some of this pause <laughs> in time. Well, I think if I was to suggest anybody starting Bob's Burgers, whew, honestly, I, I would have to suggest episode one, season one. Start at the fucking beginning. Just, just do it. Just commit. It's a great insight into the characters and keeping in mind it's brand new. These characters, these people, these voice actors hadn't truly found their voices yet. That will come. And like you, you said, I believe you said it was season three was your favorite. Yeah, um, season, season three. three is one of my favorites, but I have to say it really, really, truly kicks off that these people are who they are at the beginning of season four with that episode with, with Bob in the woods. And Over like, through Bob, and, and yeah. Tina, <laughs> yeah, and Tina making up um, for her for her lost Thunder Girls um trip so that that's a brilliant fucking episode start to finish just absolutely beautifully written it's funny it's dirty it's hilarious um, but it really shows is a testament to bob and linda's relationship and you know the kids and like their their relationship with each other and their fortitude um so season four i think for me is really the when the show really truly found its voice but i will say for anyone interested in starting the show start from the very first episode work your way up give it time it's not going to take very long you will end up loving loving these characters yeah i i i agree start the show from the beginning work, work your way through i would say for me i would probably go uh oh god i'd probably go the Fron files because that's a great just intro episode to the kids and have to how Bob and Linda interact with how the kids just are like their weird eccentric selves and how they don't, you know, demean the kids or anything like that for being weird. I mean, Gene writes a whole episode about fart saving the world, and it's like one of the funniest. No, things. blowing up the school, but then we get that whole amazing line from Mr. Fron: "I locked myself <laughs> in a room." where children were eaten. And then Bob and Linda were like, well, you're, you're kind of spitting, like say it. So I <laughs> locked myself. So the emotion, Mr. Frond was so fucking hurt. He had his feelings hurt so bad that he was the villain in all of these stories. And it all stemmed because he stole Jean's keyboard. He yeah, took Jean's keyboard and then, and then Louise ends with the brownie chair surprise. It's it's such a simple, it's such a simple reason for him being the villain, but it's absolutely amazing. But anyway, start there. But everyone, thank you so much for listening. I know this probably went a little longer, but hey, this is what you subscribe to. So what are you going to do? Um, we will have reviews up uh, incoming for the boys season three. I just finished that yesterday. I can't legally say much more than that, but I'll simply say I'll have a review up uh, weekend of July 8th. I'll have a review up here for the first couple episodes of Miss Marvel. Um, that'll actually be out this weekend, as well as a review for Jurassic Park Dominion, blah, 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 Dinosaurs, Chris Pratt, blah, blah, blah. But yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, everyone, thank you so much for listening. You can check out the show, like our pages on Facebook at The Real Pineapple and Real Pineapple Games. Follow me on the Twitter at Jay Hunter Real Pineapple. You can follow me on Letterboxd at Black Shazam. And don't forget to subscribe to the show. Give us a rating wherever you listen to your uh, podcast. Cassandra, thank you again so much for being on. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Stay safe out there.